Okay, so we are in Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. It is a genealogy chapter. When I was a young lad, we would go to vacation Bible school, and I grew up on the west side, and I don't know, I don't think growing up that um, the church that I attended when I was little, little had VBS. Uh, I don't ever remember attending that one so much, but I do remember attending a couple around our house. Uh, Vacation Bible School is like the babysitting service for Christian parents, man. I mean, it is like if you can get your kids to as many VBSs, it is awesome, right? Especially in the summer because, man, they're just going bonkers, and it's a great chance to get them out of the house for a few hours and let them be somebody else's problem. And so, I mean, blessing. And so, um, I remember uh, the ones I went to, though, were during the daytime. There was one around the corner from our house. It is, golly, I think it was Liberty Missionary Baptist Church on Overlook Avenue. I don't know if that's the name of it. Is it? Yeah, you know where it's at. Dad, is it? Yeah. Sam lives right down the street from the church, Sam Hensley. And um, I would go to that VBS. Um, they didn't have the best cookies, but it was all right. The, the one that I remember the most, though, was this one over in Bridgetown. Now, if you remember, if you know where, I think it's Race and Glenway-ish, there is a, I think there's a Canes there now, okay, there was a Wardway uh, fuel, yeah, and then right next door to that was like a storefront church. I don't even remember the name of the church, but my buddy that I played baseball with went to church there, and he invited me to his VBS, And so we went every day and had a great time. And one of the songs we learned for the final program was a song called Begat. Okay, now, um, you don't get all the begats in this chapter, but it's the genealogy stuff. And so I remember one of the lines of the song is, begat, begat, begat is where it's at. Okay? And I think that was trying to encourage kids to not just skip through the begats of the Bible, but um, I don't know that's where it's at, but they're there for a reason, okay? Okay? And so tonight as we uh, go through this, we're going to see a lot of names that, you know, if we can even pronounce them, it'll be a blessing. And I'm going to get my computer because I have a chart on here that I tried to figure out how to copy and paste it and show it up there, and it just wasn't going to look good. So I'm just going to try to read it to you the best I can. I have this really fancy software um, that preachers buy um, that you wouldn't care about that has really cool charts in it. So I'm going to read some of those to you tonight. I love maps and charts, so we're going to have a map up here tonight and see that. But before we get into all the fun stuff, let's read some names here. So we're not going to read the whole chapter at once, but let's read, um, okay, let's just read verse 1 for our official reading, okay? Chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. So we're getting the premise here on chapter 10 that uh, now we're moving beyond Noah. We're, we're going to talk about the families of Noah's sons and their descendants, okay? And it's going to break them up into different chunks. First is going to be Japheth, then Ham. Um, kind of a, a caveat or a side note to Ham would be Canaan. He was specifically mentioned by Noah. Noah cursed his generation uh, because of what Ham had done. So we're going to get a little call out for Canaan. And then Shem's descendants. And then the whole chapter in 32 ends much the same way it started with one little difference. Now, depending on how chatty I get, uh, we may just get chapter 10 finished tonight. But I'm hoping to get chapter 10 and 11, 1 through 9. We'll see. Okay? So, here we go. Japheth's descendants. I apologize for any mispronunciations of this. So the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog. Whoa, there we go, right? Already, man, we hit Magog. Is that what's going on? Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and and Tyrus. uh, And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Riphath and Togrma. And the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim and Dodanim. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. So these are the descendants of Japheth. Um, 
in a minute, I'm going to show you a map where, where most of them went uh, to be. But if you are Eastern European descendant, this is your people. Eastern Asia Minor, if that's where your descendants come from, you kind of came from Japheth, okay? Now we come to Ham's descendants, verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim, Phut and Canaan. And the sons of Cush, Seba and Havilah, and Sabta and Rama, and Sabtika, and the sons of Rama, Sheba and Dedan. And Cush begat Nimrod. My dad used to call me Nimrod when he wasn't happy with me. <laughs> and Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. This guy had a big name among all the people in the world. Verse 10, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, noteworthy, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar, which is around Babylon. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh. We've already seen Tarshish and Nineveh, right? We've already seen this. And the city of Rehoboth and Calah. And reason between Nineveh and Calah, the same is a great city. And Mizraim begat Ludim and Anamim and Lahabim and Naphtuhim and Pathrusim and Kasluhim, out of who came Philistim, and Kaphtorim, and Canaan, and here comes that break off, and Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, we later will read of the sons of Heth, not good, uh, so you have Heth, and verse 16, and the Jebusite, notice these names, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite. And the Arvadite, and the Zemurite, and the Hemathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, one of the places that uh, Abraham and Isaac uh, dwelt, unto Gaza, as thou goest to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Adma unto Zoabim, even unto Lacia. Now, you may have maps in the back of your Bible, or if you have Google when you get home, you can, you can see all this stuff. You can find out kind of where these boundaries were. Verse 20, uh, uh, verse 19, and the border of the Canaanites, we already read that, right? Yeah, 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their country, and in their nations. So another grouping, another clan or nationality of people the descendants of Ham. Um, now, Shem. Shem's descendants are the Jews and people in that area. You, you've heard the phrase Semite, or a lot of times anti-Semite, people who are uh, anti-Jew, okay? Uh, this is Shem is the Hebrew version of that. So these are the Jewish people. Verse uh, 21, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born, the children of Shem, Elam and Ashur, Arphaxad and Lud and Aram, and the children of Aram, Uz, familiar name, where Job was, in the land of Uz, and Hul and Gether and Mash, and Arphaxad begat Selah, and Selah begat Eber, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. Circle that one. Here's why. For in his days was the earth divided. We're going to talk about that in depth. And his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan begat Almodad and Sheleph and Hazar Maveth and Jera and Hadaram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abimael and Sheba. And Ophir and Havilah and Jobab, those are some lands we know of. All of these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling was from Mesha, as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, 
after their nations. Very repetitive. There, 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 there. And the reason that's repetitive is because they're driving home the point that all of these nations, all of these clans, if you will, were scattered to different areas on purpose by God to accomplish what we will read in chapter 11 if we get there tonight or next week. But before we break all of that down, let's uh, put up the map. All right, there it is. So this is the coolest map I could find uh, for this uh, topic. So uh, Jody and I learned this really cool trick you can do on PowerPoint. She's actually going to be able to zoom in on portions of this. So go ahead and zoom in on Japheth there at the top. Look at that. Isn't that so cool? Like that, for nerds, that is one of the coolest things in the world. So as you can see, Japheth, that's where by and large those people settled uh, after, after the division and after the people were scattered. So look at this. I mean, you've got... Europe, you can see France. You see the, uh, over there on the far left, you can see France. Um, that's right. And then you can see Italy, the boot, right? And uh, going into Asia Minor, um, you have Greece and, and all those lands right there. And then you can see how these circles kind of over, over cross one another. You see that right there in the middle? And so obviously there was going to be some crossover there. But this is basically where Japheth descendants started. So if your people come from there, you're most likely a descendant of Japheth. Now let's go over to the left bottom where there's Ham. Okay, now these are the descendants of, of Ham and Canaan. This is the guy who uh, in, in one way or another did something incredibly disrespectful and abusive to his father, Noah. And so God, uh, in his wisdom and his choice, put them in this area of the world. You can see there's a little bit of a crossover into the Sinai Peninsula there. Um, you go, it even goes up a little bit towards like Israel-ish, and then it's mostly there though in, in Africa. You can see Egypt, and then there's like lower Egypt there, which is modern-day Ethiopia. And then you come down further, and you've got Somalia and all these things. So that is about where uh, Ham's people come from. So if your descendants come from there, that's probably your group. Now we're going to switch over to the right side, and we're going to see Shem. These are, uh, by and large, where the Jews come from. And you can see this, this land here, this kind of settlement area, is much larger uh, than just the little portion of Israel up there. Uh, you've got the Sinai Peninsula. You've got even further east where you get into Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. And, and it kind of stops in that area. It goes a little bit north. I feel like a weatherman. You know, like, we're going to have a low pressure. It goes a little bit north up there into Asia Minor as well, East Europe. So as you can see how they all kind of cross over. But this is generally where those people settled. Okay, you can leave that up because um, I think it'll be helpful just as we talk about a few of these things. So the divisions of nations is what we're looking at. Now, I wanted to focus in. I, I ask you to remember the name Peleg. And he's found in verse 25. Now, this is a descendant of Shem, which would be a, a Jewish descendant. Now, from this line is going to be where Jesus comes from, but not Peleg. It's going to be actually from Joktan, which is his brother. It, it breaks down his... If you start in verse 26, you see the descendants of Joktan. And, and if you go all the way back, that's where the line comes from. And in fact, that's going to lead to Terah which leads to Abram, and we're going to see that in the next couple weeks. But Peleg was a son of Shem, and the Bible gives us here, now this is not chronological, it's parenthetical, okay, it's, it's a parenthesis, it's called out to give us a setting before we get into chapter 11, okay, so it's giving us a setting of kind of where everyone settled, what the world was going to look like once chapter, the events in chapter 11, the events of the Tower of Babel take place. And it's important to note Peleg. Now, Peleg, his name literally means division or shaking or quaking. Okay? That, his name literally means some kind of shaking of a division. So in, his name was Peleg because in his day, days was the earth divided. Now, you probably heard in school, if you paid attention, uh, about history or 
ge- uh, geology a lot of times or even geography about uh, Pangaea. All right? Pangaea is the one big continent. Okay. Is, that an, a, is that like a worldly evolutionary thing? No, it's actually a biblical thing. Because the Bible tells us in creation, if you go back and look at the creation account, you will see that the Bible says there was a land mass that came out of the sea. A single mass of land, earth. Okay, When we, we call the world nations, that, de, that determines people. When we hear the, the word earth or land, it determines like physical ground. So when we see in the creation account that there was water everywhere, remember the earth was started off as just a big blob, a big drop of water, and then the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, he went over the face of the deep, and, and what happens when the Holy Spirit comes? Life, right? And he, he gave life, and then out of the sea, out of the water, came a land mass, Pangaea, one ginormous continent. So at that time, before we get to chapter 11, the world was one big continent. Have you ever taken the, when I was in school, we used to do a little uh, puzzle. We would cut out the continents, and then our teachers would say, okay, try to fit them together to make Pangaea. And, And you can do that. If you take them and slide them around a little bit, you can see how it comes up to one continent, one large continent. So at this point, one big continent, one big blob of people, all speaking the same language, all just one, descendants of the three boys of Noah. But in the days of Peleg, about five generations after the flood, something happened. We had a shakeup. Now, the events of the Tower of Babel take place about five generations after the flood, and, and so we put it right around there that the world was divided, and when that happened, the parents named their child Peleg because the earth was divided. A couple years ago, we had something that affected the entire earth, all the world. Remember that? It was, I don't know if you remember this. It was called COVID. I know that's, it, it's hard to go two seconds without hearing about it, but the whole world was coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. And you've probably heard that people had children and would name their child Corona. Okay? Why? Because the baby was born during the pandemic. And so when that child is 25, 50, 75 years old and they say, what's your name? Corona. That's an interesting name. Where did you get that? I was born during the pandemic back in 2020. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. And they had to wear a mask. How crazy was that? And, And so they named them that name to remember the worldwide event. And back then, same thing. Earth divides. Well, that was the year our son was born, so we'll call him earthquake. (laughs) We'll call him division, shake up, you know. That's what they named him, Peleg. In his days was the earth divided. Now, I'm alone maybe in this opinion because I've I've asked different people and, and they're okay to be wrong, but I am alone in this opinion. I could totally be wrong. My opinion, and this is actually the physical shaking up of the earth. Here's why. Because of the words and because of the, the, the known background of the words. The word here, Peleg, and, and all the origins and stuff, I, I don't even understand it all, so I'm giving you the best of what I got. Has to do with division, mostly. It really just refers to division. So could it have been the division of the languages? Sure, it could have. Could it have had something to do with the division of uh, the areas, the general areas that they started out with? Sure. Could have started with the division of nations. But the reason I believe personally that this is dealing with the shakeup of the earth and Pangaea going from one to, to seven is because of the way it phrases it. For in his days was the earth, ground, dirt, land divided, my opinion. And I can buy the other opinions as well. But the idea is this. In this day, something worldwide happened, both to land and to nations and to languages and to psyche even. The psyche of man. 
You, you imagine waking up one day and everybody in your world who spoke your language all now speak a different language. That's going to mess with you. I mean, we couldn't even hardly do life. Uh, we had issues not being able to see people in person. Zoom is great when you need it, but man, it, it doesn't replace in-person interaction. It just doesn't. And so there is something about that messes with human psyche when something like that just rocks your world, literally. So this changed a lot of things. In his day, the earth was divided. We don't need to be dogmatic about that, but obviously there was a big shakeup in the world. So I know there's probably a lot more we could to dig into. I mean, if you go over to chapter 10 and you look at the sons of Canaan, starting in verse 15, what do you recognize? Jebusite, Amorite, Girgashite, Hivite, Arca. And you see these names, and you're like, that sounds familiar. Well, those are all the nations that dwelt in the land of Canaan when God gave that as the promised land, and he told Joshua, go in there and wipe out the Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites. Take them all out. That's your land. Get rid of them. So now you can kind of see all how this all connects and how so neat that it is. There, listen, there is not one single mind in the world that could come up with all that and make it all work out. That is, that is a phenomenal uh, orchestration of God. So we come to the end of chapter 10, and we notice it, it sounds very familiar. Verse 32 sounds very familiar to verse 1, but you can notice a subtle difference. Verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations, their descendants, in their nations, and then here it is, by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. So what are we looking at here? We're looking forward to divisions of nations. It's a little bit of a, it's a connector to the events in chapter 11. Um, now we come to chapter 11, and this is the account of the Tower of Babel. Let's read this. It's just nine verses. Let's read it and put it into context, and then we'll break it down. And the whole earth was of one language and of, and, and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, get that picture, they're journeying from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, Babylon, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So much here. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. This is so cool. So much here. And the whole earth, verse 1, was of one language and one speech. <clears throat> Makes sense. Three sons of, of Noah, they're all going to have the same speech. That's who's on the earth at this point the descendants of those three guys. So everybody speaks the same language. They're all one big blob of people just moving around the earth. And, and, and the Bible says, 
when they journeyed from the east, wherever the settlement was there after the flood, they started going west because they were coming from the east. They started going west and they come to Babylon. And if you look at a map, Babylon is in Iraq, um, Turkey-ish, Ararat. You know, you can kind of see how the blob was moving around. So they come to this place in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. They set up shop. Like, this is a good spot. Babylon is the place. So let's all just dwell here. Let's have one big nation of people, and we'll just kind of keep it right here, just us. We're the only ones, and we're going we're gonna to build a monument to ourselves. And they start talking about this. Verse 3, and they said one to another, go to or come, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. So they're starting to build something. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now, there's nothing wrong with building a city or a tower. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I have a couple facts and figures about that. Even today, nations want to build big cities, and big towers, right? Um, So, for example, you have the original World Trade Center towers, the the twin towers there. One was 1,000, now now try to keep these numbers in mind. This is mind-boggling. 1,362 feet tall. The other was 1,368 feet tall. So one was just six feet taller than the other. But that is very tall. At one point, they were the tallest buildings in the world. Now, the new World Trade Center Tower um, is 1,776 feet, 1776, um, to remember our nation's birth. So they built it even taller. We're going to come back stronger and better than ever. In fact, when the towers came down, one of the first things the U.S. government said out loud was, we are going to build a bigger and stronger and better tower once we get out of the rubble. See, it's built inside of man to go bigger and better. It's just nature. It's by nature who we are. Now, what are the tallest buildings in the world? I'll give you the top three. The third tallest is in China. It's the Shanghai Tower, 2,000, 73 feet. The second tallest is the Merdeka Tower in Malaysia. It's 2,227 feet. And the tallest building in the world is in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. It is 2,717 feet. Almost 1,000 feet taller than the World Trade Center Tower. Wow, right? See who can build the tallest and the biggest. Let's see who can make a name for themselves. Who has the best? Who is the biggest one? Who's the best nation? Who's the strongest nation? The point is, and I want us to focus on the phrase in verse 4. This is important. And let us make us a name. Now, if you're a Bible writer, circle that. And right next to it. You can, con- you can write contrast, Genesis 28, 12, John 1, 51, and Genesis 12, 2. So the people of the world at this time are like, hey, let's just all stay together. Let's make a name for ourselves, and let's build a tower so high that even if God were to send a flood, we could escape it. Build a name for ourselves. People will see our tower from far away and realize who we are. And what was their purpose for doing this? It's at the end of verse 4. Do you see that? Lest or so that we wouldn't be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. We want to make a name, we want to make a city, we want to make a tower so that we can thrive and have our best life, all humanity living in one spot, doing whatever we want. That's their idea. What did God ask Noah? What did God command Noah and his sons to do when they got off the earth? 
First thing, go. Multiply. Replenish the earth. Get out. Multiply. Replenish the earth. In other words, scatter. Get out. Subdue all the earth that I've given you. That was his commands to them. What are people doing five generations later? Wait, let's just stay here. Man, we can, if we all stick together, we can make something so great that even a God in a flood couldn't take it out. I mean, this thing's already sideways five generations in. He just destroyed the earth with a flood because it was so... Did you see the word imagination? Imagined? Look at verse 6. And the Lord, well, verse 5 says the Lord came down to see it. Now, let me tell you something. The Lord doesn't have to move to see anything. But when he does, there's a reason. And when the Lord personally shows up, it's either going to be an awesome thing or a terrifying thing. So look what it says here. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men, interesting phrase, builded. Verse 6, and the Lord said, look, the people is one. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Now watch how he says this. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Do you remember what the Bible says about what things were like in the world during Noah's day? That the imagination of man was only evil continually. And what's God's observation firsthand? It's right back to where it was. They're headed in the same direction. And now if they pool their resources and they're all speaking the same language and they all work together, they're going to be on the fast track to judgment and wrath again. And so God says, we're going to do something about this. He sees that this is going to turn out bad once again. Their unity and strength gave them potential for great evil. And they just got finished with that scenario. So how does God determine to fix this? Verse 7. And look what God says. Go to. Come. Let us go down. I love how he talks about that in the plural. Let us go down and there confound their language. So he says they were of one language. Now we're going to make many languages. Let's shake it up. Let's make them babblers to one another. Let's confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Because this is going to be a way to break up the communication so that the evil will be stemmed. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them. That's what he told them to do in the first place. Go out, multiply, be fruitful. Go across the whole earth, subdue the whole thing. I put all the animals under your care and jurisdiction. You have dominion over them. Get out and make nations. Go. And they said, no, we're going to stay right here so that we can stop any force that would come our way, even a flood from God. And God says, fine. You're going to wake up tomorrow and not understand a word your neighbor's saying. And not only that, I'm going to shake this thing up, pay leg, and I'm going to divide the world. The earth is going to be split up. There's no more Pangea. Now there's seven of them. He's going to put distance between them verbally and physically. He scattered them abroad from the vents upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. You better believe it. If you can't communicate, you can't do hardly anything. If you can't understand each other, there can't be cooperation. You ever had a conversation with somebody who is speaking the same language and you're not connecting and you tell someone else, we just weren't speaking the same language? It's hard to communicate when you're not speaking. You can't accomplish much if you're not speaking the same language. So there they were. Two changes, and man, were they something. They were so big that people named their kids earthquake. So we, can, we conclude this whole thing in verse Nine. Therefore, this is why the name of the tower, the city, the place was called Babel. And that is a kind of a play on words because even in the Hebrew, it's like a whole bunch of consonants put together, Babel. 
It makes no sense. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from there did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So God gets involved. Now, what about that make a name deal? Why was that such a problem? Because it's, it's, it's filled up with pride. And if we know anything about God, it, the Bible even says he resists the prideful and gives grace to the humble. And if you wrote down those verses, I'll give them to you again, that we want to contrast, just right over the page there, Genesis 12, 2, when God calls Abram and says, leave your country, get out of here and go to a place I'll send you. Again, God's command, go, get out. I will make you a great nation. Notice this. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And you can imply, I will make your name great. What's God saying? You don't have to worry about making your own name. I'll make a great name for you if you what? Obey. Just obey. I'll handle it. You obey me. I'll take care of all that other business. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Matthew 6.33. So there's that contrast. The other one um, was 2812, Genesis 2812. Let us make us a name. Here's Jacob. Remember Jacob's dream? Out there in Beersheba. Remember what he used for a pillow? Remember what he used for a pillow? Stone. Used a stone for a pillow. Not, not what I would call comfort, but hey. Verse 12, 28, 12. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And here it is. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed. What's he seeing? As Jacob is having his dream, he's seeing a ladder on earth. And that ladder is set up, and on that ladder, the angels of God are going up and down. The Lord stands above the ladder. And he's seeing the way up is not by making a great name for yourself, but by believing God. By listening to him and obeying him, and God will give you the promises he's given you all along. You don't have to make a great name for yourself. And if you contrast that or you compare that to John 1.51, all the way over in the New Testament, John 1.51 going to sound pretty familiar. Jesus calls Nathaniel before, listen, he's like, man, before we even met, I saw you under the fig tree. Before Philip even came to you, man, I saw you under the fig tree. And, and Nathaniel's like, man, I believe you are the Messiah. He's like, you are the one. And Jesus says, wait, because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? And look what he says in John 151, verily, verily, or Tony Evans says, show enough, show enough. <laughs> I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He was making them remember Jacob's dream, which was all about God standing above everything. Jesus Christ being the way to God. He is the ladder. He is the way to God. The way to God is not puffing ourselves up, but humbling ourselves down, following him, obeying his program, obeying his call, and he'll make a great name for you. I love how Revelation says that all of us is going to get a, get a name that we never knew before. Check it out. God's going to give us all, all his people are going to get a special name that he's going to give us. Not one that we made for ourselves in pride, but one that he gives especially to those who obey.
and the picture here in, in the Tower of Babel, it's not that it's wrong to build something or to accomplish something. But when we go about this business of making a name for ourselves, so much so that at any cost, even if it means being so prideful that in our hearts we think, even if God tries to stop me, I'm going on. It's a problem. It's a problem. And we have a chance then to humble ourselves. Say, okay, Lord, I, I release all that to you. You said go, scatter, multiply, I'll do it. This ain't about me. And so, some pretty fascinating things here in these passages uh, that lead to us seeing that God is in control. He's got it all figured out, got it all planned out. We just need to get on board. Wherever he's active, let's get in on it. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time and your word. <clears throat> and the Lord, the facts and figures and puzzles are so much fun to kind of figure out and connect and Lord, I believe you put those there for us to enjoy, to just see how intricate and vast you are, how you are so unbelievably expansive that we can't even put words to it, and yet you get involved in tiny details of human affairs. And Lord, all of it for a purpose, for your glory. And Lord, may we submit ourselves to you. May we humble ourselves to you. Go about our lives obedient to you. Lord, that if we walk in obedience to your word and to the leading of your Holy Spirit, we know that you and your grace, you and your mercy, and you by your very promises will take care of us. So Lord, help us to walk in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.